The formulatic spectrum, I'll explain what this is soon, I promise. Uh, as Brian introduced me, I'm Suze Hinton. My username on GitHub and Twitter and a lot of other places is NoobCat. Um, it stands for no up cat, so lazy cat. Anyway, I thought it was funny. Um, <laughs> I'm a front end dev at Kickstarter, so that's sort of what I do during the day. But I'm going to talk to you more about what I do not for my job. Um, I'm a member of the Node.js hardware working group, so I help try to create better tooling for anyone who uh, Node.js or JavaScript developers and want to start playing with robots. Uh, I'm also a member of the Ember Accessibility Project team. Um, I believe that front-end frameworks can do a better job of being, uh, helping people create accessible apps out of the box, so I'm very passionate about that too. Um, so why are we here? Well, the main thing that I'm going to be talking to you about is data and art and how they can come together, but also about making a mess and why it's really important to do that. And there's, if you've seen any of my talks before, I don't need to put this warning, but for those who haven't seen my talk, there's always a lot of feelings in it, so we'll just brace for that. So I want to tell you a story first so that you can sort of see how this journey began for me with some of the experiments that I'm going to show you today. It was 1994, and I was reading through this book with rather enthusiasm, and this was the book. <laughs> and you're probably thinking 1994 is a bit late to be reading a book like this, but um, that was my first computer. And so I was a, a child that liked drawing, and when I heard about these things called computers, the first thing I wanted to do was draw on the computer as well. And drawing on a Commodore 64 involved um, reading this book and like poking certain registers to get stuff to show up. Um, so I sort of fell in love with computer programming more from the art perspective, which is maybe the less traditional route. And so I sort of was this, this nine-year-old, like, littlest artist trying to find my way in going from using crayons to actually creating things with, I guess, pixels. And then I grew up and I became a professional programmer. And my focus went from play and experimentation to syntax, readability, working with other programmers, and, like, really, really important stuff that matters when you work as part of a team and you work um, at a professional company. And I care very deeply about all of those things. So at work, I, I focus on writing really elegant, easy-to-read code. I mentor juniors. Um, I write really helpful and constructive feedback on pull requests, et cetera, et cetera. So it's something I care about a lot. But in my personal time, I sort of try to do things that are outside of that, and that's the message that I want to convey today, that sometimes it's important to sort of break out of that stuff. And so after growing up, I still sort of did this stuff in my spare time. So this is an image of uh, some JavaScript library that I wrote called OLEDJS, and what OLEDJS does is it essentially creates and abstracts a driver so that you can put messages, uh, pictures, text, anything you like, really, on this OLED screen here if you have it plugged into an Arduino. Um, and I really like cats, in case you haven't noticed already, so that's going to be a recurring theme through this whole talk. And so I have a lot of fun still trying to enable people to create art, but also just reminding myself that art is where my roots started in programming. So I still think of myself as this accidental programmer because I, I didn't go through college, and um, I sort of have, I feel like I'm this double agent that leads a double life. Um, so, you know, I don't really care about semicolons, whether you use them or you don't, you know, whether you put two on the end or not. It just, that sort of stuff doesn't really matter to me outside of my professional life. Um, so, to give you an idea of the, the sort of imagination that, that I have, I'm going to tell you a story within a story. So, who's read this book here? A couple of you, yay. Um, this is Contact by Carl Sagan. This is Carl Sagan. Um, this, this is a very apt description of him. Uh, if you haven't seen any of his documentaries already in any of his books, I highly recommend it. Uh, a friend of, friend of mine gave this to me a while ago and said, I think you will really like this book. And he was right. The main character in the book is uh, Dr. Ali Arroway, and she works for SETI, and she's looking for extraterrestrial life. And she grows up to be a radio astronomer, and she has sort of, she reminds me a lot of me, so this is a book that I can, I can really relate to. And Ellie Arroway actually does find extraterrestrial signals beaming back to Earth, 
and her entire life is turned upside down. As she tries to make sense of this, she tries to lead a team to decipher the message, and it takes her, um, takes her all across America, and she finds herself in New York attending all of these really important meetings. And she'd never been to New York before, and when I read this book, I was living in Australia, and the way she described New York really captured my imagination. And she talks about taking trains to all of these really important meetings she was going to, and she rejected having chauffeurs and things like that, and I think that's really awesome. And while on these meetings, she was, her brain was so wired to be deciphering messages and deciphering um, and data in, in the real world that she started listening to the, the noises that the train was making in the subway, and she ended up missing meetings because she kept trying to stay on the trains because she was convinced that there were secret messages everywhere. And so when I came to New York, I thought of her, and you know, I live there now, and I've fallen in love with the subway for like very similar reasons. And sometimes I'm disappointed when I reach my station because I'd rather stay on the train than go to the social engagement that I'm going to. Um, <laughs> and so these are just some images for those who haven't seen the trains or, or what the subway looks like. It's this whole other world underground and really does capture my imagination in a very romantic way. And Ellie Arroway is told by numerous people in the book and in her lifetime that she's too romantic about things. So I really like that about her. So she kept thinking that she could hear these messages. Um, but I realized that there's a difference between Ellie Arroway and me when it comes to deciphering these messages. And that is that Dr. Arroway didn't have JavaScript. So I thought, OK, um, I know JavaScript, and I'm like a lot of other JavaScript developers. I just try and do everything in JavaScript. Um, I think that's something really fun, and I'm really looking forward to Matt's talk uh, later this afternoon, which is all about just doing stuff in JavaScript because you can. Um, really great talk last night. Um, and so I thought, OK, if I use JavaScript, like what can I make these sounds that Ali Arroway was hearing? How can I visualize them, and, and how can I sort of try to make up something that doesn't exist in the sound, but, but is meaningful still. So we can find out via art, and we can actually use the web audio API, so we can do all of this in the browser. So I promised that I would explain what this is, so we'll go over this really quickly. The formulatic spectrum is essentially, if you imagine like working with data and you have this kind of like line, and you've got data integrity on one side and data corruption on the other, right? So in a, lot of, um, in a lot of circumstances, it's really important to remain sort of one-on-one -on -one with the data or to be very accurate in how you represent that data so that you don't mislead people, right? So I'm thinking about graphs on some of the famous graphs on the New York Times website, um, the way that Bloomberg like, um, shows their data. And then if you don't stick with the data and you start dropping it out or corrupting it or just messing with all the numbers, then you get corruption down the line. And so it's really important to, to stay like loyal to the data, right? Well, not really, because when you're creating art, it doesn't matter. Like n that sort of stuff doesn't matter. So I'm gonna show you an example of like one-to-one -one data and art, and then just like completely subversing it on the other end. So we've got two examples. So most of the stuff is probably gonna be around this position though. So we're gonna have some fun. So analyzing PCM data, who's actually played with the Web Audio API before? Yeah, it's super fun, and I was talking with someone recently about this. It's the most in-depth API in the browser, I feel, that I've ever seen. Like, it just has so much rich things that you can do with it, um, including analyzing live audio. But what I wanted to do was sort of, like, secretly record sounds in the subway and then, like, analyze them after the fact. So this isn't live analysis. And the way you can do that in the Web Audio API is by an analyzing the PCM data of, let's say, a WAV file or, or an uncompressed file. So PCM stands for Pulse Code Modulation. It's just the raw uncompressed audio data, so it's not like a MP3 format or anything like that. It actually is just, um, just the pure data. The samples, so each value in the file, other than, of course, the, the header at the, at the beginning, um, the samples range from negative one to positive one, and how many samples in the file depends on, obviously, the sample rate and the bit depth. Um, and so some common PCM format uh, file extensions are .wav, .af, .au, .l16, and .pcm. And this is a Wikipedia SVG that did not scale very well. You can see how off those dots are. Um, but this sort of gives you a, a, a representation of if you're trying to 
sample analog data and then put it into digital format, you have to have these um, algorithms that determine like how often those samples happen and then you can map that through. So, so it's those actual samples that we're dealing with today. So there's a lot of sounds on the subway that people hate and I know that a lot of people don't like the subway either and I really love it. So I'm trying to create something really beautiful out of something that a lot of people either dislike heavily or just come to ignore. So the sample file that we'll be working with today is this one. Stand clear of the closing doors, please. That ding dong at the end is so obnoxious. <laughs> okay, so, so just think about that. There's some, there's some speech at the beginning and then there's a ding dong at the end. I'll play it just one more time. Stand clear of the closing doors, please. Okay, definitely etched in people's memories. So what if we took this sound and we mapped one pixel per data point? So you know, for each value that was negative one to one, we, we assigned a pixel to that. And then what if we just changed that range and mapped it to be zero to 255 instead? Because negative one to positive one is kind of a weird range to work with when we're talking about things like colors or, or any kind of value in JavaScript. And then what if the new value, so the value from two to, uh, zero to 255, affected what the hue value of the pixel was? So we can kind of alter color depending on what the value of, that, of each sample is. And there's a lot of samples in just that one WAV file, so let's have a look at how that comes together when we use um, Canvas to put one pixel per sample. Um, but before we do that, I wanted to show how short or, or like how much code you have to do um, in order to get that going, and it's, I think, 13 lines here. Um, that's how easy it is to start creating art in the browser and to start using the Web Audio API. Um, so definitely have a look at this code sample in my slides after the talk. Um, but the, the main point you need to know is to create art digitally, a lot of the time you're just running for loops and you're just manipulating something and then you're just like calling refresh on the page to do that. Um, so you can see here that we're, t we're analyzing our data, we're assigning a hue to it, we're manipulating our image data object in Canvas, if you've used that before, and then we simply just, once we've got all the new sample values, we, we put those pixels onto the Canvas. So it looks something like this, and the contrast is letting us down a bit on the screen, um, but you can essentially see that it's not just all uniform, that it has actually analyzed all of the different sound bites. And if, if you can see closely enough, you might actually be able to make out certain parts of the sound that you might remember. So you can see at the top there, you can make out the individual words and the pauses in between the words of the speaker. So you can actually see stand clear of the closing doors, and then he pauses just a little bit more, and then the please right at the bottom here. Then you can see the white noise of just, you know, just um, ambient noise while uh, they're pausing, and then this really super bright rainbow bit here is the ding dong, and I just love that that turned up so obnoxiously as well. So I feel like this is you know, a pretty accurate visual representation of the data, and for people who, um, for people who are, are deaf, like, this is a great way of describing, like in a different sense, like how sound is interpreted, which I think is really cool. The only problem is what you just saw there was 300,000 pixels. Um, there's probably better ways to code what I put together um, because when you console log out the value of every single loop, you will crash your browser. <laughs> um, so I was just trying to verify that, you know, I was having some sensible pixels being put on and that's really not a good idea. So that's an overwhelming amount of stuff to, to sort of deal with. And again, it's not on a production level, like professional setting. So you can actually start picking these things apart and doing things with them. So let's reduce it and let's go more towards the corruption end of the formulatic spectrum. What if we tried to take audio, analyze it, and then create completely new audio from it? What if we tried to make a song? And you can already imagine this is a terrible idea because how do you let a machine make a song and still have it sound pleasant? So this was sort of my exploration of exactly how to do that. So let's take something pretty standard. Let's have 16 beats. So we have 16 beats. We want to deal with one block of data per beats, right? So we want 16 blocks of data to represent this song. So what if we took our 308,000 samples and we divided that by 16? We end up with 19,295 samples per beat. That's still a problem, right? We haven't done anything really to reduce it. 
So what if we got really cheeky and we started corrupting things and we averaged the sample values of each beat? So what if we added together in each block the 19,000 samples and then we found an average from like negative one to one, we just found the aggregate um, of that. We kind of have stuff to work with, right? But it's still, even though it's broken down a lot, it's still reminiscent of the original data that we were working with because you can see that there were very big blocks um, of, of patterns in the data as we saw when we visualized it. And then what if we wanted to accompany the song with some kind of tie back to our trains? What if we took each value and depending on what value it was, we could assign a seat color that represents the really lovely seat colors that are in some of the trains in the subway? And then what if that was coupled with, you know, whichever drum beat we wanted to play based on that value? And these are simple if-else statements. If if value is between x and y, then we can assign a certain value, right? So it's pretty simple to set up. And then what if we decided that maybe certain values trigger a cat to be sitting on the seat and the cat plays a certain guitar strum and note? Now, I'm not sure how this will sound because the oscillator sometimes blows out speakers, so we'll just see. Um, but if you would like to, um, again, these are all embedded in my slides, so you can play with this later if you'd like to listen to it with proper headphones. And if you do, I, I apologize. So this is a, a, a quick demonstration I put together of how we can visualize the sound at the same time as playing it. So let's see what averaging all of this out and assigning instruments to it ended up being. <laughs> super fun and I'm not sure whether you could call that music but it came out a little more pleasant than I thought it would um, but let's let's have a little bit more fun with it right that's it's not super exciting so I have this friend his name is Mark Johnson uh, he also lives in Brooklyn um, he's a really cool guy and he's a very funny guy too so I met up with him in a cafe recently and I said you don't happen to have any weird sounds that you've recorded where you're making sound effects with your mouth and Unsurprisingly, if you know him, you would expect the answer to be yes. And he, he basically dropboxed me a bunch of really weird sounds that he made for some game that he was designing a while ago. And so I thought, what if I you know, put the oscillator in and stuff, but what if I substitute some of these musical notes for silly sounds that he makes? So let's hope the oscillator doesn't drown out his awesome sounds. <laughs> Okay, so that, that's a bit of a racket, but I thought that that was actually really fun. So, yeah, he thinks that's really funny to see himself visualized in this way. So, you know, once you have the formula for something, you can just swap things in and out and really play with it and see what you come out with. So this is something that, to me, is not very deeply um, explored yet. This is, some, this is a project that I want to explore a lot more and see if I can actually study more music theory to get some, some more pleasant results. But that's an example of how you can um, corrupt data and then create something that's really cool but, but is still you know, at least slightly reminiscent. So the way I put this together, it's actually not Canvas this time. I used SVG images that I drew in a program called Graphic by Autodesk. Um, I just created a bunch of divs, so those seats um, are just floating divs next to each other and the arrow that follows along at the bottom is a CSS arrow um, and I'm just using JavaScript to like move the positions of things and, and using CSS animations for the cats when they play the guitar. So a lot of it is, if you're a JavaScript programmer or a front-end programmer, there's skills that you already have. You don't really need to learn anything else. The main thing is to use the Web Audio API to analyze the data to get that in the first place. But you can get your data from anywhere you like um, without looking like a weirdo <laughs> trying to record sounds in the subway. And you could probably tell, especially the musicians in the room, that I'm not a musician. Um, and so I'm still working on that and trying to make things better. But I am better at hardware things. That's kind of what I'm known for, especially in the open source world. So then I thought, what if I could take that sound that I made in the browser, what if I could take the song, and then what if I could then bring that back into real life and then play that sound in the subway? Um, I know that's really weird, but it's something I wanted to do. Um, like, what would this look like? Um, so I took it a, a step further and the JavaScript meetup I go to in, well, actually, there's three or four of them now in New York City is called 
Brooklyn JS. And this is actually their ticket. So when you buy a ticket and you show up on the night, they give you this token. And you can swap this token for a drink, or you can keep it, and the money they save from not buying you a drink, they donate to Scripted, which is a wonderful um, code teaching initiative. And I thought this was a really clever riff on the Metro card design. So this is actually what a real Metro card looks like. And I thought, this is a really clever riff because most of us take the subway to get there. It's right near the Bergen stop. Um, you know, the bar that we hold it at is right near the Bergen st uh, station. So I thought, what if I did my own interpretation of this, um, given that the Brooklyn JS meetup has been such a heavy influence in my life, both socially and, and technically for a while now. Um, so I sort of took this design and I tried to reproduce it as a printed circuit board. So this is me trying to lay out all the pieces and trying to invent what it's actually going to do. So you can see the black layer is the silk screen and you can see all of the traces underneath, which um, I'm still learning about optimized traces and, and putting them on an angle so that they're less, um, they're less fragile and things like that. But this was a really fun exercise for me to do. So this is what the actual device looks like, and I'm, I've, I've got it here today if you wanted to play with it, and it does work. I just charged up the battery. Um, so it's supposed to be like an old-timey speaker gramophone thing, and all it does is read a sound off an SD card. So I can put the sound that I've exported from my browser, I can put it on the SD card, and when I hold the button down, it plays the sound. Um, so that means that you don't have to have a browser with you. You can take your transform sound with you wherever you want to go. So I 3D printed the speaker... Um, housing once the PCB order arrived. Um, I didn't etch my own PCB, I uploaded the, the files and it came to me from the internet, uh, which I love. So come and talk to me about that if you'd like to know more. Uh, this is me with the stock closing door sound. So this was like a first test after I soldered it together to see if it was working. So when I put the sound on it, it doesn't quite pick up the oscillator, so I need to put an op amp into the socket. So there will be a Metro card V2 very soon. Um, but I've loaded the, the exact same sound on today so that you can hear it because it is very quiet. Um, the speaker is stolen from a greeting, one of these musical greeting cards. Um, so it doesn't take a lot of watts, so it's easy to blow out. So we want to keep the volume kind of low, but you get the idea. Um, so the goal is like, we're, we're, I want to take the, the music further to, to make better music, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, but I want to put more JavaScript in this, right? So last, last year, I wrote a tool called AVR Girl. And what it does is it uses Node.js to flash C, uh, compiled C programs onto microcontrollers. So I have some headers on this here, which allow you to just directly program the chip on the board, which is cool. So I've done that. Um, there's a little bit of JavaScript there. Uh, the other thing that I started working on recently was streaming the sound from the browser to the board. So this requires a, a, like the SPI interface, and the SD card uses the SPI interface too. So I have some bottlenecking issues where I need to be swapping between, for want of a better term, someone please let me know how I can replace master slave, because that's a terrible way of describing things. But I have to play with that relationship to get the sound streaming onto the SD card, but while also you know, um, communicating back to the programmer at the same time. But Again, ask me about that if you'd like to know more, and I'm probably going to be seeking Matt's opinion on that later on. Um, and of course, as I've mentioned a few times, I want to make better music, because I think that this could go somewhere, and if you, if you arrange some better sort of harmonies and things, it's actually quite easy to make like foolproof music from accidental data that you can't control. Um, I've seen a lot of artists do really cool stuff with that. Okay. <laughs> things got a little bit weird, um, but there was a point to this, and there's a point to why things got weird. It's art, and that's okay to create things that you didn't think were going to happen. I think that's important to be able to take the time to explore that. So what did I learn from all of this? And what's the point? And what can you all take away with you? Creative coding gets you out of your comfort zone. You know, when, when, you're in, when you work for a company every single day, or you work for yourself, or you freelance, you're usually solving problems that come up over and over again, and they're very familiar problems to you. You're just solving them in a better way or a slightly different way each time. And I feel like creative coding just presents this new set of issues, problems, performance stuff, all sorts of uh, weird APIs that you haven't worked with before, and it gives you an opportunity to actually do that. And I think that that makes you a better programmer in the end, in my opinion. Art doesn't care about your semicolon feelings. So you can write this stuff, and it doesn't 
matter because most of the time no one's going to see the code. And the point I'm making is that it's not about the code. It's about what you produce as an end result. You know, you, you want to you judge those results and not like, yeah, but what does the code look like underneath? It's just, it's so irrelevant to me in the journey that because art doesn't care about perfection, it's, it's whatever you want it to be. And so again, it's about exploration. Killian McMahon at, at work, that's his Twitter name, he sat down with me on a hack day and I said, Killian, can you teach me how to music? I don't, I don't get it. So he started scribbling these things down for me and I'm really grateful for that. And I actually work with him very uh, frequently. I, he's a designer and he writes the HTML and the CSS at work and I implement the JavaScript for it. And so we're used to working in a very, um, in a very technical way but we've never talked about music before this project. So I got to know a side of Killian that I've never seen before, which is that he plays music in his spare times. He plays gigs. He's actually opening for PyCon, who, if anyone's coming, um, they're the adventure capitalists. They make fun of the startup scene, and they're really clever, so you should see Killian's band. Um, so he's, I think he's going to teach me a little bit more, and I really value having a different side to that relationship. You know, we're, we're a very close pair at work, and this has just like improved our relationship. So it's really about what you learned and what you learned about yourself and what you learned about others. So my advice is to take some time out of your day jobs where you're expected to be perfect all the time and write some messy code. And I want you to make lots of mistakes too and just say this isn't what I thought it was going to be but this is kind of cool. I'm going to just make a new branch in Git and then just like go this way instead. I think that's a really valuable thing to have. It makes you feel a lot more free. Because you deserve a break from being judged all the time. There's been a lot of language bashing and sort of snarky comments at this conference, and that surprised me a little bit because I thought that the point of bringing programmers together is, is because we're all sort of aiming for the same thing, which is to be really good at what we do and to talk about why we love programming so much. So if you have the privilege of spare time, I know not everyone does, just sort of start typing like this and just... <laughs> Just see what comes out of it, you know? And, and there's been many a times when, you know, I've had maybe a glass of whiskey too much and then I've written something really insane and then woke it up the next morning and going, what is this? And I think that's really important, actually. It's, it's, it's taught me a lot about the fact that even though I'm capable of being a great programmer, I'm still okay with just slapping some paint around on a canvas and, and that it, it makes me feel like that nine-year-old trying to program the Commodore 64 to make pictures again and it's, it's important to remember who you are. So my advice is, when you have the opportunity to, code like no one's watching. And if you can, yeah, for the benefit of others, don't get rebase I on these kind of repos. Don't squash down mistakes. You know, you can leave comments saying, lol, what WTF is this, but don't squash down your mistakes. Like, let other people see them. Let juniors in the industry see how you actually put things together. And this will remind them that no one writes perfect code from out of the gate, even if you're already familiar with the problem. Everyone refactors, everyone goes back over and discovers silly things that they've done. And I think that I've seen too many juniors in our industry have that blank file, that blank canvas fright where they feel like everything they write down needs to be in a way where they knew what they were doing right from the start. And that's just not true. And I don't think we should perpetuate that. And I think we do unconsciously through being perfectionists ourselves. So just get push. And that, that was scary. I've pushed up a lot of, uh, actually all of the code that I showed today. And it's all first pass. I just wrote it really quickly, I laughed at it, and then I pushed it. And it was actually really scary to do that because you know, it's, it's in the public space. Not many women are programmers on GitHub who actively contribute to open source. And so that, that can be used against me. But I think it's important, again, to say, here is my professional open source, and here is my silly open source. And so I'm st starting to try and create that dichotomy because I think it's healthy for all of us because then it makes it okay for others to do the same thing. So make some art, like throw it away. Um, it doesn't matter because it's just code, right? It doesn't cost anything. So if you want to have a look at my silly demos, you can go to the following address. Um, ILTSW, just to help you have a mnemonic, it, it stands for I love the subway. You can find my slides here. So again, it's, it's my github.io slash formulatic spectrum. And so you can play with the, the demos that I have in there if it's more helpful to you. Um, I'm going to be blogging about this project really soon, just describing how I did everything and just a deeper dive into the technical side of things. So my blog is meow.noobcat.com, in case you didn't already know how into cats I am. 
Uh, and thank you. <laughs>